אנחנו הגענו בעצם בכרונולוגיה שלנו לירושלים ולפרויקט המרכזי של בורישץ וזה כמובן הקמת בצלאל וניהולו של בצלאל עד שהוא נסגר בשנת 1929 וזה היה פרויקט שב-1906 נחשב באופן כמעט רשמי לפרויקט המרכזי של התנועה הציונית בעצם ואני רוצה להזמין את יושבת הראש של המושב הזה שלומית שטיינברג שלומית היא יוצרת בחירה לאומנות אירופית במוזיאון ישראל היא בעצם אחראית במוזיאון על התקופה שבתוכה כל הדברים שאנחנו מדברים עליהם עכשיו הם חלק מהתקופה שהיא עוסקת בה ואחראית עליה אבל חוץ מזה היא גם עסקה הרבה מאוד כחוקרת בהזדמנויות ב- שונות באומנים שהיו בבצלאל בייחוד באבל פן וגם באחרים ובבקשה שלומית אחר צהריים טובים ותודה שחזרתם מהאוכל בזמן המושב שלנו בעצם נפרד מאירופה המזרחית וממרכז אירופה, מהבלקן, מבולגריה אבל אני מבטיחה לכם שהוא יהיה לא פחות מרתק גם במקומות האחרים שאנחנו נבקר ואחד מהם הוא כמובן לונדון אם הסתכלתם בתוכניה שלכם וירושלים אז אנחנו בעצם אה, במושב הזה ננסה סוף סוף להגיע אל הספר ירושלים הבנויה שנמצא שם מאוד חזק ברקע לא רק ברקע לכנס הזה כמובן אלא אה, בסוף דבריו אה, דוקטור גדעון עופרת הזכיר את הכנס בסנט לואיס כבסיס אה, שממנו שאב שעץ את ההשראה, את המחשבה על האוטופיה שלו. אבל יש לנו דרך קלה לפני שנגיע אל הספר. והדוברת הראשונה שלנו, שתדבר באנגלית, ונושא ההרצאה שלה הוא The Bצלאל School of Arts and Crafts and the Anglo-Jewish Identities. וכשקראתי את ה... אבסטרקט של טניה וכמובן את הביוגרפיה שלה אישה צעירה ומרשימה אמרתי רגע זה נורא מעניין הרי הגלריה של לונדון לאומנות יהודית זה הבן אורי גלרי בן צלאל בן אורי טוב זה ביזיון שלי כי אני חברת ועד שם ואף פעם לא חשבתי על ההקשר הזה אז 1-0 לי אבל כן גם בלונדון הרחוקה כשהקימו את, את גלריה בן אורי שהיא בעצם המקבילה של המוזיאון היהודי ליודאיקה בקמדן זה הייתה המחשבה הם התחברו לירושלים היה ציר מחבר מתודולוגי ומנטלי בין האיסוף שלהם לבין הרצון לא רק לזכור שהם בלונדון אלא גם לזכור שהם מתחברים לירושלים. אז טניה, טניה בנטלי היא עוצרת משנה במוזיאון של הגלריה לפורטרטים, הגלריה הלאומית לפורטרטים בלונדון והיא עובדת שם אה, בעיקר בתחום המאה העשרים ואומנות עכשווית וגם אה, קשורה לתוכנית התערוכות אה, וגיבושה. טניה השלימה את ה-BA שלה בהיסטוריה ובלימודים צרפתיים באוניברסיטה של ברמינגהם ואחר כך היא המשיכה לתואר שני באומנות ובהיסטוריה של העיצוב במוזיאון של אלברט וויקטוריה שעובד על התואר הזה יחד עם הרויאל קולג' אוף ארט. התזה שלה למאסטר הייתה The Bצלאל School of Arts and Crafts and the Anglo-Jewish Identities 1906-1926 והיא בעצם הבסיס להרצאה שאנחנו נשמע ממנה עכשיו. אז without further ado, Tanya please. Good afternoon everybody and uh, thank you so much for inviting me today to speak to you all from London. Thank you to the steering committee. So today I'd like to share with you part of my research which has looked at the way the objects produced at Boris Schatz's Bezala School and its accompanying craft workshops in Jerusalem interacted with Britain and Anglo-Jewish life in the early 20th century. 
The British Jewish community in the early 20th century was characterized by emancipated Jews who were well established within British economic, political, and cultural life, alongside recent immigrants from Eastern Europe fleeing anti-Semitic persecution. The established members of British Jewry were patriotic and sought ways to assimilate into British culture rather than make conspicuous assertions of their Jewish identity. And for similar reasons, Zionism during this period was received with caution by established British Jews. Based on this very brief summary, it's not immediately obvious that Betzalel objects, which made clear assertions to Jewish culture and Jewish national identity, would appeal to Anglo Jews. However, what I want to show is that despite this ambivalence towards Zionism during this period, and the conscious adoption of British cultural habits, for a time and for varying reasons, Anglo Jews, particularly those who could afford it, purchased Butzalel objects, visited Butzalel exhibitions, and supported the school financially. I'll try to demonstrate this um, by firstly looking at the support for Butzalel amongst British Zionists during the early years of the school before the First World War, who fundraised for the school and commissioned unique objects. And then I'll discuss key exhibitions that helped bring exposure to Butzalel objects in Britain and amongst Anglo Jewry more widely, the earliest in 1912 as part of the two-day Palestine exhibition and bazaar in central London, and later on in 1924 and 25, when as a British mandated territory, Palestine and its industries um, were included in the British Empire exhibition in Wembley. By thinking about the various contexts and motivations behind the consumption of Butzalel objects in Britain, this paper will argue that these items weren't simply products used to promote Zionism. The movement of objects from one local context to another, in this instance from the craft workshops in Jerusalem to the homes of British Jews and local Jewish and large imperial exhibitions, can cause shifts in meaning, use and value. And what I found is that when absorbed into these new local networks of meaning in Britain, but Salal objects revealed multiple components of Anglo-Jewish identity and British imperial identities. An incredibly useful source for tracing the activities of the Batsala school in Britain has been the Jewish Chronicle, or the JC, which, as many of you will know, is the most widely distributed weekly British Jewish newspaper. Now, whilst taking account for its biases, it's helped me draw very important conclusions regarding the reception and popularity of Batsalel amongst British Jewry. And throughout my research, I came across hundreds of reports about the school, from as early on as 1905, when the school was yet to open its doors, which helped bring exposure to the school's activities. I've included just one example um, of an article on the screen from June 1907, containing photographs of the school's classes and carpet pattern and Hebrew monogram designs, as well as an interview with the early Batsalel founder, Otto Warburg, and I think there are portraits, the portrait of Boris Schatz there as well. As a newspaper that was openly pro-Zionist during this period, it welcomed the opportunity to promote practical Jewish pro projects in the Yishuv in Palestine, such as Butzalel, often characterizing the school in its report as a place of revival, cultivation, and aspiration, not only for impoverished Jews living in Palestine at the time, but also for Jews worldwide in diaspora communities. British supporters of Zionism seized on Butzalel as a way to promote Zionism in Britain more generally. In March 1907, the JC published a written letter by Boris Schatz in which he called on the British public to donate and establish Butzalel associations, asking them to mirror American supporters who were already very busy arranging special Butzalel days in, in aid of the school. And indeed, as Schatz intended, in this pre-war period, Butzalel associations sprung up across Britain. The most engaged group I found was based in Liverpool, Chaired by the Zionist Benjamin Benas, the Liverpool branch held concerts, lectures on art, and special Butzalel evenings to raise money for the school, 
and went on house-to-house -house canvases to raise awareness and boost Batala membership. And there's similar evidence of fund this sort of fundraising activity in London, Leeds, Manchester, Glasgow, and Edinburgh in Scotland, and Dublin in Ireland. Despite membership levels in Britain being consistently low in official Batsala reports, certainly in comparison um, with other countries like America or Germany, it seems that in these early years of the school, there was a genuine interest in the school's activities by British Zionists, but perhaps not necessarily because of the aesthetic quality of the pieces, of their designs, rather their style signified a series of socio-economic configurations seen as ennobling. It was the moral import and the provenance of the pieces that really spoke to British Zionists. And by Batsalel, fund Zionism was the key idea. The promotion of the school's activities encouraged British supporters to commission unique items that materially express their support for the Zionist movement. And I've located examples of commissions from synagogues and Zionist affiliated organizations across the UK. But I'll just bring one example today. The German born Jacob Moser, who you see on the screen, was a wealthy textile magnate from Bradford in the north of England, who then went on to become the mayor of Bradford in 1910. And you see him here depicted in his mayor robes. Although he was very active in his local Bradford life, he was also a keen supporter of Zionist institutions in Palestine, including the Batsalel School. And during my research, I discovered a collection of letters between Moser and Boris Schatz in the West Yorkshire Archive Service in Bradford, which demonstrate how Batsalel objects featured in Moser's life, later life in a significant way. In 1909, Moser was presented with these special silver filigree gifts um, made by Batsella. I think I'm not cutting some of that off, um, to mark his 70th birthday. And they consist of a handwritten Megillat Esther, which you see on the left, um, in a case, and a pen with the top unscrewing to reveal a paper knife, and a beautifully decorated container, um, which contained uh, an illuminated address to Moser thanking him for his support. The knife and container carried these bold inscriptions from Butzalel to Moser, which proudly promoted this personal connection, and they're now all still held in the Bradford City Council archives. It's likely that these gifts were given to Moser because of his generous donation of 500 pounds to Batala when it first opened and his subsequent commitment to donate 2,000 francs, the equivalent of roughly 80 pounds annually, which he did from 1907 to 1912. Perhaps the most significant example of Moser's support and interest in Batsalel was his decision to commission a unique object. In 1912, Moser exchanged letters with Shmuel Ben David, the then head of the carpet weaving department, to discuss the concept for this unique design. Ben David wrote that there would be a seven-branched menorah with its, its eternal flame depicted alongside the two educational institutions that Moses supported in Palestine at the time, but Salel and the secondary school in Jaffa, the Hetzliya um, Gymnasium, to which Moser donated um, around 25,000 pounds. Today, um, as if frozen in time, there's um, a large carpet on the floor of the Bradford Reform Synagogue. Um, try and get the image a bit better for you. <laughs> Which Moser helped establish in 1881. And this carpet bears many similarities to Ben Dover's proposed design. Unfortunately, the carpet's in quite a bad state in need of conservation, but you can still easily make out the impressive building of the Herzliya Gymnasium at the center and to the left, the menorah. We know from a letter written by Moser in August 1918 to one of his acquaintances that he chose to display these items, the commission carpet, the filigree objects, as well as the Damascus metal plate, which I haven't been able to locate, in the sitting room of his large home in the suburbs of Bradford which is a space where he would have regularly received guests and as, as such would have played a very important role in the performance of his identity. And this example, as with others that I've found, demonstrates the way that Batsalal objects 
heavily weighted with overt symbols and moralizing messages about Jewish nationhood, began to permeate Anglo Jewry's domestic and devotional spaces during this period, functioning as apt tools for constructing and projecting Jewish national identities in active support of the Zionist cause. Now, I want to turn to a really significant event in the history of B'Tzalel and um, British Jewry, uh, which facilitated a wider engagement with the B'Tzalel school and its products beyond British Zionists. In May 1912, um, B'Tzalel objects were brought to London in large quantities as part of the Palestine Exhibition and Bazaar. Over two days, Anglo Jewry and the British public were invited to an exhibition of Jewish and Palestinian products in the Portman Rooms on Baker Street in central London, which was a space often used by the urban upper middle class for charity fairs. The exhibition was organized by leading members of the Anglo Jewish community to raise awareness and funds for two Jerusalem schools, the Evelina de Rothschild School for Girls and the Batsalal School. And local variations of this exhibition appeared later on in 1912 in Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds. By the late 19th century, themed charity bazaars were a popular social phenomenon, especially amongst the urban middle elite. Often characterized by an interest in exotica and Orientalism, British Jews were appropriating this phenomenon for their celebration of Jewish culture. When the exhibition was first announced in December 1911, it aroused much excitement, and one commentator in the JC noted that, quote, it was the bazaar promises to be one of the most interesting Anglo-Jewish functions of the next season. The organizers tried to disassociate the exhibition from the Zionist movement. When the exhibition was first conceived, Lady Swaithling, who you can see on the right there, uh, who was the chairwoman of the event, clarified in a short statement in the JC that the Palestine exhibition and bazaar is, quote, in no sense connected with the Zionist organization. Her husband, Louis Montague, would actually later set up the anti-Zionist League of British Jews. A bitter editorial response to Lady Swathing's letter followed, accusing her of choking off Zionist support for the exhibition. To summarize these underlying divisions, the editor of the JC, writing under the name of Mentor, noted how, ever since the days of Herzl, Zionists have been largely identified in the uninformed popular mind as the only Jews who are interested in Palestine. The exhibition is a signal from English Jewry that Palestine is the abracadabra of the Jews, not of any section of our people. And in much the same way, what I found is that B'Tzalel objects appealed to non-Zionists because of the wider spiritual and cultural attachment to Palestine that they fostered, considered symbols of a mystical, otherworldly, or as the writer describes, abracadabra link between Jews and the Holy Land in Palestine. The British architect, John Meyer, was, was commissioned to design the exhibition space. Um, as an apparently typical Jerusalem street with domes, latticed windows, and turreted roofs in the style of Ottoman architecture worked into the structure. And it's clear from an existing floor plan, which you can see here, um, that the Betzalel and Evelina stools took center stage just under that dome. And according to contemporary reports, there was, quote, a multitude of beautiful objects to tempt the visitors, including carpets and rugs with Hebrew letters woven into the design, delicate filigree work and jewelry, amongst other things. Near the Batsalel and Evelina stalls were displays of Oriental fancy goods and Eastern dolls, and stall attendants were dressed up in Eastern costume. And it was even possible to have your palm read by the fortune teller, Madame Albu. These oriental stools, as they were described, had no bearing on Palestinian industry or local culture in the 20th century, but they appealed to popular representations of mythical, biblical Palestine. And I think this is a really important reminder that the public and domestic spaces into which Batsalal objects were entering were already heavily charged with various notions and popular stereotypes of Palestine, or perhaps more accurately, Jerusalem. 
The publication and wider entertainment program um, surrounding the exhibition indicated again that it was not simply intended as a promotional event for the work of Zionist institutions, rather as a wider celebration of Anglo-Jewish culture. For example, the substantial, substantial exhibition catalogue entitled A Piece of Mosaic, the cover of which you can see on the screen, which was designed by the English artist Frank Lewis Emanuel, was mainly made up of extracts from poems and theatrical productions by Jewish authors whose subject matter rarely centered on Palestine or even Jewish culture. To make the exhibition relatable to visitors, the organizers introduced elements of their everyday life and habitual experiences of Judaism in Britain through familiar European Jewish objects, artists and writers, and popular notions of Palestine and the Orient. And the result was that the context in which Batsala objects were displayed and received by visitors to the exhibition was at odds with how Schatz and British Zionists tried to promote them. Um, I now want to consider briefly, within the time that I have, um, what happened to the status of Batsala objects during the British Mandate period of Palestine. Once Batsala objects re-entered Britain 12 years after the 1912 exhibition in the context of mandatory Palestine, they were now arguably repositioned as treasures of the British Empire. And I think nothing illustrates this change in status more for Batsala objects than their inclusion in the Palestine Pavilion at the 1924 and 1925 British Empire exhibition, which was housed in this extensive 216-acre Wembley Park in North London. The exhibition attracted over 25 million visitors in 18 months of operation and included pavilions for each of Britain's overseas holdings. And it was meant as this wondrous display of resources from Britain, uh, from British colonies, and was an attempt to ensure the empire's stability following the upheavals of the First World War. Within the Palestine Pavilion, an image of which you can see here, but Salah fancy goods were included in large numbers. And a Times newspaper reporter commented that the, that the exhibits were, quote, extremely good and very interesting, especially the decorative brasswork and enamel. Schatz later reported that even Queen Mary had supposedly purchased a number of silver art objects at the exhibition. Included in the 1924 pavilion was this ambitious holy ark um, made by Betzala students and two of the school's leading designers, Ze'ev Rabban and Mergo Arie, um, which would no doubt have made an impression on visitors to the pavilion. Alongside the Betzala stools, were displays of industries in Palestine um, that had supposedly sprung into life under British control, such as tobacco growing and brick making. And the pro-Jerusalem society um, had a stall displaying Jerusalem pottery and Hevron glasswork. And this society was established in 1918 by Ronald Storrs, the British military governor of Jerusalem, and Charles Ashby, um, civic advisor to Jerusalem during the mandate period, partly to preserve and revive ancient Palestinian arts and crafts. And the, what I think is, is significant is that the positioning of Batsala objects in the pavilion alongside such British initiatives signaled a change in status for these objects from pieces of Zionist to popular imperial material culture. In line with earlier uh, Victorian and Edwardian imperial affairs, the Wembley exhibition introduced races in residence as the official guide described it, whereby local people from the respective colonies were displayed at work in supposedly authentic settings. And for the 1924 and 1925 Palestine pavilions, Yemenite Jewish workers who had trained at the Batsala school since their immigration to Palestine at the turn of the century were chosen to demonstrate the skills that were being fostered in Palestine under British rule. An image of one of the Yemenite workers was included in this May 1924 report in the Illustrated London News. And you can see uh, the Yemenite worker just in the corner over here, the bottom left-hand corner, alongside the many other picturesque types, as the article describes them, brought over for the exhibition. 
Although promoted under the pretense of education, the display of native craftsmen at Wembley reinforced racial stereotypes and colonial hi hierarchies. Not only were Yemenite workers who were recent immigrants to Palestine ill-matched to embody ancient Palestinian craftsmanship, the commercialized theatricality of their display within this constraining environment of the British Empire exhibition ran contrary to Boris Schutz's vision of Butzala workers as independent and self-sufficient. And their inclusion in the exhibition clearly demonstrated the way Butzala craftsmen, their skills, and therefore the objects that they produced were being seized as spoils of the British Empire. Now, just to conclude briefly, this talk has presented various platforms for Butzala objects in Britain. For British Zionists like Jacob Moser, as Schutz intended, these items became projections of their Zionist aspirations. However, once removed from Palestine, Schatz ultimately had no control over the context in which Batsala goods were displayed or sold. At the 1912 Palestine Exhibition and Bazaar, Anglo-Jewish voices reinterpreted Batsala objects as they saw fit, as items of popular exotica and markers of an upper middle-class philanthropic consciousness, but also as objects that encompass wider notions of Anglo-Jewish identity that seem to dilute, blur, and misinterpret Zionist principles extolled by Butzalel. Finally, the presence of Butzalel objects in the largest and most important British imperial exhibition of the 20th century situated these items in context beyond the concerns of the Zionist movement or Anglo Jewry, repositioning them as products of the British Empire. Thank you so much for listening.